just before the break. Oh, that always makes me jump. <laughs> right. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome to Crafty Crows. We've got a wonderful evening tonight. Um, we've got the lovely uh, Kitty Donnelly and also the fabulous Helen Ivory, who's going to be reading tonight. So really looking forward to that. And I was just about to say that we're doing something slightly different tonight. We're going to have some open mic at the beginning, then we'll have Kitty, then we'll have a break, then we'll have Helen, and then we'll finish the open mic after that. And that means if we have got a couple on reserve, we might be able to squeeze them in, which is good too. So um, I just want to say to everyone who may or may not have entered our GPS um, summer poetry competition, Thank you for entering. We've had an enormous number of entries. I can't believe it, actually. More than twice what we had last summer. Adam Horowitz is our judge. Um, it's been wonderful. Peter and I, are sort of eyes are going a bit funny from staring at screens <laughs> and getting all these poems in. But um, yeah, and we'll be in touch in a few. Well, I'll be giving you some to add Adam after a couple of days, and then we'll be in touch towards the end of September with the winners. That'll be interesting and exciting. Um, okay, with no more ado then, I think I'm going to open up and I'll start with a poem if that's everybody's all right with that. Um, I'm gonna start with a poem from my recent, we're getting bored with this I'm sure by now. <laughs> I'm doing this every month. But this one you haven't heard. And this one I wrote for Thomas Trofimuk. Now, Thomas Trofimuk is a Canadian novelist and poet. And in part of his novel, This Is All A Lie, he writes about Garamond's life. And the typeface for the novel is Garamond. And that gave me the idea for doing Garamond as the typeface for my uh, collection. Um, and there is a, a sentence at the end, which will make more sense if I explain that there's a recurring theme through all his writing of snow. So this is called The Reader for Thomas Trofimuk. This woman is in love with a new man who has entered her life though they've never met. A man who writes and as she reads his words, she knows him. His phrases have a heavy perfume of musk, thyme and rosemary. His punctuation thrills her skin as she waits for the qualification of a statement, a concept, an emotion. The font on the page is Garamond, and his stories are like her dreams. She returns to her bed, opens to the next chapter, eager for what is to come. Outside the window, snow falls gently. Thank you. Okay, without any more ado then, we'll get started. Um, have we got Brian Franco here? No? Ah, well, we won't be getting started with Brian Franco, who was first on the list. So if we'll go straight on to Margaret, Margaret Royal, would you like to open this up? Is that all right? Sorry to shock you there. <laughs> <That's> Actually, <okay. laughs> Peter normally puts the, 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 the order on the chat, so I'll quickly read through. We'll have Margaret Royal, then Sue Burge, Laura Greville, Carlos the Unhappy, Alice Stainer, and Pratiba Castle. Hope that's all right for everybody. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Thanks Margaret. If everybody would... Um, sorry if everybody would mute themselves and just unmute at the end um so as to give an applause that would be brilliant thank you right hello everyone uh i'm going to read a poem that was published quite a, a long while ago in the first thing that hedgehog ever published of mine a stickleback and it's recently been out in Dreich, is it or Dreich? I never know how to pronounce it, but anyway. Um, and it's called A Season of Swallows. They come in a ripening April, lanes long and heady with dew and ransoms, 
soaked by the singing in of sweet miracles. Weary winged veterans, full of creak and clamour, resuming old turf wars in barn and byre. Dawn light breaks earlier now, dappling the clouds with a powder puff touch. Feverish activity indoors, relentless clocks ticking like metronomes, defining the impatience of time. A sudden downpour releases sweet sweat of late spring warmth, hanging the damp morning air out to dry. Dipping and darting, settling only where instinct gives safe landing, a wild chorale of well-schooled song, youthful energy belying the frailty of their bodies, a weft and weave of nesting, birthing and fledging follows. With wings full bloomed, a distant marshalling call resounds on the balmy air amid syphilit and sousia. Nights lengthen, daylight shrinks, gusting wind chaps skin with sharp slap. Rising on mass, a courageous gulp, the lure of warmer climes compels, a whoosh of frantic flap and flail, then gone into a morning haze, the only echo, a hollow murmur lingering briefly on the chilly air. Summer gradually fades to dust in a feathered drift of ghostly dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Margaret. That was beautiful, beautifully read too. Could you please unmute and give Margaret a really lovely round of applause? Thank you so much. And sorry for pushing you into the first spot, but you did brilliantly. Thank you. I shouldn't have complained about being last, should I? <laughs> <laughs> did you? I didn't know you did. <laughs> okay, next Scottish... up we have Sue Burge. Hello, Sue. Hi. Lovely to meet you. Would yes, you like nice to, to meet you? Poem, please? Yeah, um, lovely to be here, everyone. Um, I've got a poem in, it's a three-parter, um, and it's about the sea, and uh, a little bit about my frustration that it's so wild at the moment that I can't swim in it, not being as tall as Martin Figura, as we were saying uh, before we started. It's called Threat. Threat. One. The sea boasts how deep and wild it is today, how good the world feels between its salty fangs. Flint lies on the sand, wet, powerless. Last week, the sea laid a faceless seal pup at my feet. I have seen dogfish fly. I waver at the edge, try to remember the spell for floating the magic number for going under and still having the strength to break free from the sea's rough lick. Two, walking the strand line, deep in maybe today's the day I'll find amber thoughts. A huge coldness blots out the sun, a paraglider, and I know what it is to be shrew or vole pinned by a dark, slow wheeling shadow. I want to fold myself, find a womb space, be lullabied back to soft, wet sleep. Then there are two of them, three, and they own the whole sky. Why would they bother to look down, see a woman on a beach struggling to breathe? Three. Mm -hmm. My scattered sisters, skins left on the beach like raincoats. We are being written into a new legend. Sisters who can unmass their bones. A gelid sliding back to primeval soup. Sisters, we need to start again. As land becomes sea, we are othering in the oceans. Ready, yes, we are nearly ready, yes. 
Thank you. Okay. Wow, that was beautiful. Thank you, Sue. And I love the ending, the sisters, and we are I, othering, was it? And ready. Oh, brilliant. Thank you so much. Please unmute and give Sue Burge a wonderful round of applause. Okay, next up we have Laura Greville, please. Hi, Laura. Hello. Good to see you tonight, everyone. Um, I'm reading a piece called 1980 Juneteenth Rising, and I'll just read this one poem tonight. I'm walking down this hot street. I'm holding a baby walking down this hot street. I don't know why I'm doing this yet. I'm thinking I'm just doing my job. I'm a park leader, a skinny white girl on this second ever Juneteenth parade in Austin, Texas, celebrating the day the slaves heard they were free. I mean, I know why we're doing it. I work at a park, two parks. One, all the kids are black, one is mixed race. But it hasn't really dawned that the heat of this march is not just the sweat of my arms, the sweat of this child who is black, not just our sweat sliding over each other, intermingling and dropping, sizzling on the brutal street as the drums come solemn behind us. It hasn't even dawned that the need of this child is not just that this child's mother is at work, not just that this child is a defenseless infant. As the drums come solemn, as the drums come solemn, come solemn. We're marching down this hot street, a gaggle of kids between three park leaders, all squinting into the sun, almost nobody watching from the sidelines, cause this ain't Congress Avenue. This street is a backside to ugliness between the Villa Capri Motel parking lot and the Lyndon Baines Johnson Presidential Library parking lot on a street radiating heat cooking us like stew. But we march on, this baby and I. We made it, sister, and you never complained. At nine months, you knew. It's taken me 59 years. Today, I'm marching down this hot street. I'm marching down this hot street with you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Laura. That was wonderful. Very vivid. Please unmute and give a big hand to Laura Trevor. Brilliant. I just love the difference in our open mic. It's so fascinating and brilliant. So next up, we have Carlos, Carlos the Unhappy. Are you there, Carlos? Yes, hello. Hi. Hi, so I'm going to do another narrative poem, and it goes out to uh, um, all bullied teenage girls the world over. And it's called um, Jenny Brooks, Flaming Schoolgirl. This girl on fire, fire, fire of rising orange hair flowing tall, walks resolute on fire in spectacular flame, walks tall like amorphous orange red fire angel, not stumbling in corridors of derision, but walks resolute, blackens the ceiling tiles, flames flaming, waving all over, walks resolute as she passes all pale arms of once mouthing banshees, passes around burns as if sweet angel doling out calm assurance, yet scolds with new red burning hot touch. But then, nearing the end of the long school corridor, Jenny of the flame drops gently along the wall, slides down in tragic slow collapse under hot rising fire licks and lies right there in the corridor 
Outside classroom F8, French, emptied, abandoned. Her body blaze swaying, fading. She curls up on the floor, lies there quiet, as if resting in Jesus's fine, holy wooden stable, blaze in black of still animal eyes, a nodding goat. She lies there quiet, her own eyes closing, content amid the rising screams as pupils run from the building to chaotically congregate on the green grass out front, crowding under lead skies in their bright white blouses, white shirts and the bright lights, blue and red, dancing on the wall, the sound of sirens crying and confusion, the gauze of phony silver sympathy yet to rise. Jenny Brooks, queen for a day, queen for a day of all the world's albino wolves, packless, outcast, scrawny and famished, a princess of muck with a mind of cuts, who closed down dreams, who bit the night alone, who swallowed the lightning and scraped the stars from the sky. Thank you. Wow. Thank you, Carlos. That was amazing. Please unmute and give Carlos an amazing um, round of applause. I'd love to read that on the page, Carlos. I really would. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, well, we're doing so well that I am going to just give warning. I think we could probably get Annie Ellis in. So if you want to get your poem ready, Annie, before Kitty, yeah? Okay, that's brilliant. So we'll now go on to Alice Stainer. Hi, Alice. Let's have your poem, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to read you um, a poem about a tortoise. Um, I really love tortoises, um, and uh, I met one recently. Uh, called Thomas. So this is the the tale of our encounter, um, and it has a it has an epigraph um, to it from D. H. Lawrence called, which goes, "All tiny, tiny, far away, reptile under the first dawn." And the poem is called "Still Life." You are ninety years old, but infinitely more ancient. Geological. Our encounter on the lawn is a page from Jules Verne. Close by amongst the flare of flowers, a heron stands, petrified. Who is to say which of you is the more alive? Slowed by the sun's subsidence, you wait the lush grass, resistant as granite. My bright energy, profligate, restless, collides with your carapace, ricochets in sunbursts but you abide contained, content. Forgive me, Thomas, for I doubted. I proffer a petal, a pop of pink on my palm. Sudden spike as you lunge and champ, and I understand that sometimes there must be a holding, a cleaving to the core whilst the world cartwheels. No need to raise my voice to reach you at your centre. My tender tip gives just a little on your obdurate head, strokes gently, seismically, inch by inch your head upheaves, from beneath your crust eyes blaze and the surge is geothermal. Thanks everyone. Oh that was beautiful, thank you. Please unmute and give a big hand of, of applause. Alice, um, you, you may comes so alive I want to see it I want to I want to stroke it it's brilliant thank you um okay next we have Pratiba Pratiba Castle hello hello great to see everybody and hear everybody's poems so this uh poem it's from um you're probably getting bored with this also. It's from uh, A Triptych of Birds and a Few Loose Feathers, published by Hedgehog Press, hopefully soon. Um, 
It's a window onto the 60s, the swinging 60s. The only one who loves you. Spurning words that echoed like a curse. I stuffed a duffel bag with blister packs of pills. Mary quant minis, fantasies of girls treading daisies in the muzzles of guns, escaped to the big smoke. In a bedsit by Kensington Gardens, I massacred steak with the mallet of hate. A year on, turned vegan, pioneer in 68 of pity for pool eyed cows, sheep, slate stare place feigned compassion, strove to prove to myself that I was worthy of love, strutted the nights away with flautists, a harpist whose healer's hands strummed my strings, drummer, his silk-tipped stroke nimble on the snare, callous guitarists plucking tunes from smoke drifts, Chanted mantras with Ramdas in a basement in Notting Hill. Dost in a Maida Vale squat. Candles, caller gas stove. The one tap, drip, drip in the bog beside the back door. Made out off my head with a sweetheart leaf philodendron. Burnt joysticks to placate Carly's hoard of swords. Sweeten the vibes, man. Stench of catlet. No one from the Highgate commune I crashed in next ever emptied. Spoon spooned marmalade from a jar, half full, recycled from a skip. Almost believed myself deserving of love. Till come the morning, I forgot. My heart tenderized with grief, discovering the night my mother died. Love is an ether you can choke or float in. Wow, love is an ether you can choke or floating what a last line thank you so much Patriba. please um unmute and give Patriba a really brilliant round of applause what an open mic tonight you're almost a feature in yourselves i can't believe it um okay next up then we'll have annie annie have you got a poem to share with us you're that's right i do and this is a true story. It really did happen. And I was in the middle of it. It's called Painting the Town Red. Sand blows between my toes as I sit on the promenade wall. Out to sea, a blue mirror shrugs off seaweed and shells. I look to the skyline, watching sails, triangles of cotton pull at the wind, filling my senses with salt and gulls calling. A dark patch far on the horizon is growing faster as it comes. It darkens the sky, fills the beach with blood. Millions of ladybirds cover everything in sight. The sand, pier, roads, houses. When they cover people on every bare bit of skin, they bite. Like vampires, they try to find food, but our skin is too thick. Everywhere they land, they're painting the town red. Gosh, what an experience. That must have been frightening. It brilliant, way of, brilliant way of describing it though. Thank, thank you, Annie, that was brilliant. Please, a big hand for Annie Ellis. 
Thank you very much. I'm just wondering, actually, we still have a few minutes. Maybe we can squeeze one other person in. Um, Doc Janning, where are you, Doc? Are you there? Has he disappeared? I am here. Hi, Doc. <laughs> Sorry to put this on you, but um, we might as well squeeze our reserve in if we can. Um, so please, if you could, would like to read a poem, just one, that would be brilliant. I think I could manage that. It's titled, The Tao of Love. Within the Tao of a deeper forever, Rose an essence, the essence of love, a profound truth, a truth expressed by sages and philosophers, prophets and poets, in all the thoughts and dreams and languages of time, in all the explanations, extrapolations and interpolations, exploring its myriad meanings, the sets and dimensions. Love exists within sunrise and sunset, day and night, dark, light and shadow. And love exists in all the shapes and dimensions of the multiverse, echoing, shining into the forever, beyond forever. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. That was lovely. Thank you. Lovely note to, learn, to end on. That was brilliant. Please unmute and let's have a really big hand for all our open micers so far. That was fabulous. And I'm just going to run through. Margaret Royal, Sue Burge, Laura Greville, Carla the Unhappy, Alice Dana, Pratiba Castle, Annie Ellis, and Dr. Dunning. Brilliant. Well done. Wow. You've done us proud. I'm really proud of you all. Um, so next up, we have the wonderful Kitty Donnelly. Um, and I first found about Kitty because I was reading one of um, Nigel Kent's reviews, which I don't know whether you've come across them, but I was reviewed just last week, so I'm very pleased about. And Kitty was reviewed a few uh, weeks ago, uh, months ago, actually, I think. Um, and I, I, she, her poetry book, The Impact of Limited Time, is a wonderful first collection published by Indigo Dreams in 2020. She has degrees in English, mental health nursing, and an MA in creative writing. Kitty won a Creative Future Award in 2019. She has worked in mental health services for many years, but she also does house clearance and, and animal rescue, which is quite intriguing. Um, she has had poems published widely recently, including Miss Lexia, The Rialto, The Honest Ulsterman. She lives in West Yorkshire, although this is her 32nd house move and she's lived all over the UK. Her roots are Northern Irish. Um, I would just like to say I am another peripatetic individual, uh, Kitty. I've lived in 30 houses. You've actually beaten me. <laughs> that is amazing. Anyway, could we have a big hand for the marvellous Kitty Donnelly? Thank you. Thank you. Um, the first, thank you for having me. Um, by the way, thank you very much. And I thoroughly enjoyed the open mic. I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Um, the first poem I'm going to read tonight is from my collection, The Impact of Limited Time. Um, it does it does have swearing in. It's the only of one of my poems tonight that does. And um, so I'm, I do apologize if that offends anybody. Um, this is the poem I entered into the Creative Future Award um, in 2019. It's about growing up in poverty in a small um, West Cumbrian town, and it's called The Flat Tops. The Flat Tops, they call this line of concrete prefabs. Two years here, the rent man said, and they upgrade you to one at t'other end with a roof. 
a desiccated mouse hid in the workings of our handout cooker. Life went backwards. I slept in my school uniform that autumn, dreading the dawn chorus. My tongue turned against me. By the coal hole at night, I watched chimneys breathe in unison. Our own fire laboured to smoulder. In the crescent where graffiti swore, fuck this, fuck that, I dialed Childline, cause it was free. The listener a touch too keen for each instalment. It was my own voice I chased down the wire and found unjudged but flat as parchment. Thank you. The second poem, um, I was lucky enough to do um, an, uh, uh, sorry, an MA in creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan University. Um, I've only just uh, qualified, but one of the tutors I studied under was Carol Ann Duffy. Um, she asked us to write a sonnet and being a bit naive and even in at the age I am, never having written a sonnet, I thought she meant the Shakespearean iambic pentameter. So I said to her, um, I, I'm really nervous about this, uh, Caroline. And she said, don't be so silly. I'm talking about 14 lines, which was I thought was great. So here's my first sonnet. It's called The Still Woman. She climbed down the rungs of herself to reach this space forgetting how her frayed tongue lapped at the well of wishes, what those wishes could have been. What shocked the most is that she offered no excuses, allowing nothing as though nothing was hers for the taking. They expected explanations. They expected her to want. The trees being felled by the railway line She's on her side, her knees drawn up, this static woman. Hearing chainsaws grunting through the bark, she senses wood's resistance. Give, shift into stillness. Thank you. So the third poem is about my hatred of bureaucracy and the... Um, the various laws and things that make it very difficult for people that I've discovered over the years, particularly working in mental health services. And it's called envelopes. Let them spore on the doormat, council demands, red top statements, court summons. Let bailiffs bang their meaty fists and dust dull the unmoving curtains. Let the meter turn through the switch stuck on. Let rates increase, though taps never run. She can't be fined, filmed, ticketed, threatened. However far their systems reach, they cannot touch her now. And there's no forwarding address. So um, Josephine mentioned the drop-in um, with Nigel Kent, which was um, fantastic. And uh, I loved Josephine's and I loved also doing that. It gave me some insight into my own poetry, actually. And this was the poem that I used um, for the drop-in. It's actually based on a, a true story um, told to me by my dad, um, who's from Newry in Northern Ireland, about a relative. Who, um, who vanished in the early 1960s and has never been found until this day. So it, it appeals to my sense of mystery and it's called the relative who leapt from his breakfast and was never seen again. Was it the monotony of morning? It's blase light drowsing in the room where the virgin promised over the mantle all's eternally well. Was it the sooty hollows thumbed beneath his Noreen's eyes? 
the way sausages stacked against quartered toast, how oil from a fried egg slicked towards the beans. I must get the paper, he leapt, his abruptness disrupting particles of dust. The terrier stood then sat. No one saw him turn onto the street. We were told that his black overcoat retained his shape on the rack for months. The breakfast became a tableau. Loyally by the door, the wiry terrier waited in character, mourning for a master that not only did not come, but never came. I know what it is to find yourself on the edge of yourself when you thought there was running to do. When you rolled your dice with a fighting chance, but all your hope was burning out of view behind the curtain of your coping. Is that where he was, that coatless February, with pockets of cold questions jangling like coins long out of currency? Thank you. Um, the final one from my um, collection um, is migration. I wrote this hopefully to capture something of the um, the autumn when the nights are drawing in and the sparrows line up on the wires. It's called Migration. All night I listen to the fair being dismantled. Lie imagining the carousel, disbanded horse by horse, the unbagging of goldfish that longed for rush as lost coins fill the mouths of penny falls. The sycamores shawlless. Frost sprinkles tiny gemstones on our flower beds. Goose pimpled legs chase covers. Suddenly hedgerows are restless with seeds of flight sown in a dream. Now as light sliced by the blind steepens its gradient Ticking engines wait to migrate to the cold roads of England. On ponds and wetlands, geese arrive in formations. Um, and the, uh, the remaining poems are hopefully going to make up my um, second collection, which, fingers crossed, will be published next year. And the first one is a poem about alternative wedding vows, and it's called Vows. Will you hold me with my scant illusions still aflame? Haul me from the crest of a violent dream. Steer me towards morning when you'll drench the room in sun and see the pillow cross hatched on my cheek, my dress slept in. Sometimes my tongue can run and run. Sometimes I stumble into silence, speech occluded. What of evenings when our tempers bark like dogs, the tread of patience bald and shallow? Will you stray from me then? There are ghosts that go where I go. Will you take with my hand theirs? And staying on the theme of alternative um, vows and gifts, this one is about um, exchanging presents. For his birthday, he wants an owl's hoot. The flash of a fox, russet in russet undergrowth, a tricky gift to give. She desires an oak apple necklace. The holes for string already gall wasp burrowed through one side of each borrowed bud. No jewellery, no Audi, no Caribbean cruise, but the warmth of fur against her cheek. The shrew her cat brought gently by mouth over park and road to place intact at her feet. He wishes for candlelight where flames weave stories, her arm around his back, pressing with the safety of substantiality. Wants to sketch her when she flicks black wings of eyeliner, wishing he were her. 
she needs is morning racket guaranteed. Dishes clattering as he whistles with the robin. If not this, then nothing. Uh, my my dad died in 2003 and um, he was a brilliant dad. He was also a great writer and he was also a great friend as well. Um, so when I lost my dad, I, um, I kind of lost myself a little bit for a while. And this poem is about that time. It's called Hi. An Arctic turn will fly 10,000 miles to flourish in two summers worth of light. So I was high after he died, chasing sun on the wing, though directionless. I swallowed three green capsules every night, peristalsis pulsing them through my scorched esophagus. I took what I could get to alter consciousness, Testing my fragmented sense of time against the wall yeah. clock's competence till dawn was yeah, salmon red and gutted on the banks of the horizon. I was not oh, sorry, or even near myself. Thank you. Um, I've only got a couple more. Um, I hope I'm not using up all the time here. Um, this poem is uh, called The Goldfinch. It died quietly on my palm, externally unruffled, its body just beyond a living warmth. I fought the dual tragedy and privilege of holding it, unsure at first what bird it was on the turn of becoming. A jag of lemon lightning across each wing, red masked. I recalled the Fabricius painting, wall fixed perch, chain clasped like an iron rosary to a claw foot saw from the wings insistent rising. The expression marked by an uptilt of the chin, like a child suppressing with pride their furious griefs. Um, this poem is inspired by the, uh, the Van Gogh painting of the, um, of the same name. I believe the technical term is an ekphrastic poem and it's called Weeping Woman Seated on a Basket. She crumples in the middle of her working day, lost bald in her fists, tears slipping over wrists, snaking down sleeves how to carry this defeat, how to complete chores with it heavy as an infant on her bony shoulders. These are the captured coals of her griefs. Their flames elude the artist with their heat, their raw humanity. Though we weep in separate centuries, it's to the same dark mirror. Tell me she survived rising from her basket, striding out onto a street that soiled her skirt hems, slipping into arms that had the strength to hold her weight. And this is my um, final poem. I hope I've timed this, this right. This is a poem I wrote um, in the first lockdown, as it's now known. Um, We'd, had, we'd just had COVID actually, we were, we were really unwell and, and obviously um, being, a, being a nurse, you know, that was pretty, pretty much inevitable. Um, I think I wrote this um, when I was sort of off work recuperating and it's called Clemency. Weeks, strong sun has seared the soil, incongruent, luring us out as though it were natural for summer to crown in April. The valley swelters, febrile under lockdown, hearts leaping at each new symptom, temperatures checked like the time. I want lightning cracking over the heap, thunder clapping like Thursday's hands and a high wind loosed like relief. 
who took for granted the gift of effortless breaths, reassurance an arm through an arm can give, lips on lips, hair brushing a cheek. I did, I did. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Wow. Oh, that was wonderful, Kitty. Thank, Thank you so much for Thank all of that. I mean, I can't just... wait for your next collection. Please unmute and give a wonderful applause for Kitty Donnelly. You Thank read you. your poems. They were as beautifully read, beautiful read as they were on the page. Thank Fabulous. You. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Thank thanks you everyone. So much. Mm. Lovely. Wow, that was wonderful. And uh, no one has to follow that now. We'll have a break. Um, if you'd like to stop recording, Peter, and then we can have a chat, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Oi, oi, oi. Thank you. Don't I swear. Always wait for that. <laughs> OK, everybody, thank you. And welcome back to the second half. Um, it's going to be a wonderful second half. And it's going to, you know, we had a brilliant first half. Um, thank you to Kitty Donnelly again, because um, that was a wonderful, wonderful set that she did there. OK, and now we have the wonderful Helen Ivory. Now, Helen is a poet, <coughs> excuse me, a poet and visual artist. Her fifth Blood Axe collection, The Anatomical Venus, was published in 2019. It examines how women have been portrayed as other, as witches, as hysterics with wandering wombs, and as beautiful corpses cast in wax or on mortuary slabs in TV box sets. It was shortlisted for last year's East Anglian Book Awards and won the East Anglian Writers by the Cover Award. She edits the webzine Ink, Sweat and Tears and teaches creative writing online for the UEA. Um, and the um, writers... Oh, National Centre for Writing. Right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it says WCN and I'm thinking it's, it's the wrong yeah, way yeah. around. <laughs> the National Centre for, for writing, Creative Writing, yeah. And I can attest that she is a brilliant um, tutor. Um, a book of mixed media poems um, Hear What the Moon Told Me is published by KFS and a chapbook, Maps of the Abandoned City, was published by Servision. She has work translated into Polish, Ukrainian and Spanish as part of the Vesopolis project. And I know that the lockdown has been a great disappointment because you were likely to have travelled and read yeah. your book, uh, work yeah. abroad. Yes. Um, she also co-hosts live at the butchers butchery with Martin Figura, and that those have to be put on the comment. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hazel it sliced as you wait. <laughs> <laughs> Please unmute yourselves and give a big hand uh, for welcoming Helen Ivory. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, I'm going to read a poem, what I have never read out loud in front of people before. It's a, it's a little sequence called The End of the Peer Show. And it was on um, the Friday poem um, about three weeks ago, I think. And so, so um, imagine Coney Island. <laughs> imagine um, Yarmouth Pier. Imagine, uh, imagine, I don't know, Apocalypse by Candy Floss. It's, it's got, it's, yeah. Anyway, so one of one of my narrators is a, a carnival barker, and there's some other voices coming through. I don't know. Let's make of it what we will, shall we? Um, this is the end of the Pier Show. Roll up, roll up, ladies and gentlemen, for this once in a lifetime, once in a death time experience, coming to your town for one night only, this five ring circus of mythic proportions. Take off your shoes, peel back your eyes, remove your epidermis, ladies and gentlemen. Open yourselves up to the whole grand menagerie. Let Snaggletooth Twilight rummage your old bag of bones. This is the dream where you are a tightrope walker suspended over a crucible of molten glass. You know in your heart you shouldn't look down. When your mother calls from the basement, you let your glance fall. 
and it's done. Everyone leans in to see the educated fleas harnessed by gold thread to carriages and ferris wheels. A two-bit accordionist tries a creaky accompaniment, the music of the spheres between smoke breaks. Test your skill and chutzpah on the eye-popping hoopla game. Hear the circles of hell whistle about your ears. Stare slap bang into the abyss, ladies and gentlemen. Mind your step on the way in, leave your pusillanimity at the gate. The sea bridles beneath the splintered boards, but everyone is wrapped in their own heedlessness. Clothing thick with the scent of burnt sugar, candy floss cleave to the crags of their teeth. The speeble rush of sweetness to the brain and the hall of mirrors transcribes you as a side-spitting freak show mask, delirium brindling in your shell likes. It's hard to look away when a spectacle dances itself free from the dark crescent of the hippocampus. A contortionalist, I can't, uh, you, yeah, try, you, right, put words into poems what you can't say. <laughs> I'll, I'll start the, the beginning of this little section again, right. It's hard to look away when the spectacle dances itself free from the dark crescent of the hippocampus. A contortionist tattooed with all seven continents is suspended over a circle of lions by the rope of her hair. And you feel a tightening at the collar of sinews at your neck and the slow creep of centuries up the ladder of your spine. You console yourself with the fact that you are chow for no beast and somehow fall asleep. This is no ordinary act of two-bit trickery. This is Mephistopheles, the great magician. Witness him speak with the voice of a hundred spirits, see beyond the veil. Call forth your drowned daughters, your stillborns and all your dark fathers. And when the secrets of the universe have been revealed to you entire and your skin a ghastly sheen, take your dead back home with you again. Let them wild your dim parlor with their graveside flowers. These nights, the voices test you with seductions from the other world as lightning rips through the sky to unearth you. And it's clearer than day when it does, that look on your face as if you have been expecting to fee be found so incontrovertibly lacking. You hold your soul that threadbare shroud to the light and utter the beats between thunder and lightning as if this tallying might lead to deliverance. The magpies are gathering apace this morning and the tempest that cartwheeled the sea has smoothed down its skirts and put on its blithe morning face. The pier is dog tired. Its baptism has washed away the human debris but its legs appear to lurch as it tries to maintain its own bulk. One by one, the birds are called away and the clairvoyant, the palmist, the dog-headed man and the princess of the sea open up their shutters for another's day's grind. That's the end of that sequence. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, Thank you. I can so I can see. Yeah. Anyway, hi. Um, so I, I'm going to read you a few poems now um, from the Anatomical Venus, um, which is about it's about women and otherness as how we've been seen as hysterics and, you know, witches and not quite right and all of that kind of stuff, you know. Um, and this first poem is called The Fainting Room and it's a, so, so the vibrator was used as a, a to cure hysteria. You, some of you might have seen the film, and um, yeah, it was it, it invented. I think in kind of I don't know. I can't remember the exact year, but the the nineteen hundreds. Um, but I've, I've usually got these details down. I'm, I'm out of practice, darlings. I'm out of practice. Um, by a, 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 a doctor, yeah, as a labour saving device for doctors and husbands everywhere. Um, and all well to do households had a, a fainting room where ladies could retire to and, you know, loosen their corsets and breathe and, and that. Um, so this is the fainting room. When they laced me tight this morning, my body split asunder. 
clouds heaved themselves across my eyes. Nobody heard the crack of rib or witnessed the small moth of my soul slip from my mouth. All day I felt the separation so keenly, yet the household continued about me as if unaltered. When Nell came to dust the parlour, I feared for my soul, my little ghost settled on the mantel. At dinner, my soul watched from the wallpaper as I raised the soup spoon to my lips. There wasn't space beneath my corset for a single bite. I rose to reach my hand out, but her wings blurred ash. I felt the table and the diners fall away. I woke inside this little room to find the doctor had been summoned with his new mechanised instrument. My binding had been loosed. The doctor applied the treatment until a paroxysm possessed me. I breathed deeply of the whole earth. My soul flew into my open throat. My husband dropped some coins into his hand. In part of my my research, I was Googling like you do, and um, I, I came across an, an article, I think it was like um, 10 signs you might be a slut, um, which I thought was kind of useful, useful um, checklist. And because of the reading, other reading that I've been doing, um, I, I just took the language back a little bit. So this is six signs you might be a slattern. Are you a little draggle tail? Do your skirts be devil leavings from the gutter? When you take a turn around the park, do bitches bear thee close and claim you kin? Are you wanton in your daily intercourse? Your ankles grind your lips stained cochineal. And how's your baking lately? Is your dough a coffer for sluts pennies? Do you hear ill clamouring in your breast? Is there a midden where your heart should sit? When a caller raps, does your front door acquiesce directly? The catch already sprung. So many questions. Another thing that I was reading for the anatomical readers um, was the Ladies' Dictionary, which is very handy, um, by someone called John Dunton, and it was written, um, put together in um, eight, um, 1684, and in it he put all things that he thought ladies should know like there were lo there were lo just loads and loads of pages on how um, he liked ladies' hair, which is blonde, and how to keep it blonde. And there was lots of blonde, and there was lots of hair. Um, but there were, yeah, just lots of really you know dictionary things. Anyway, this so th this is the entry for anger in ladies, etc. Um, makes a beauteous face deformed and contemptible and separates roses and lilies by quite removing one or the other out of the ladies' cheeks. The ladies are ripping roses and lilies to rags. They are broadcasting them like bruised confetti, trampling them into the carpet so the parlour reeks of death or the mask of death, death spangled up, death sullying the carpet. The ladies are rendering themselves contemptible. They are pollen stained and beastly. They are pouring the floorboards. Now they will lecture you on how to wear your hair, Mr. Dunton, how to cover your shame. They are sharpening their knives. So continuing the theme in anger in ladies, etc. My new collection, which I'm um, putting together writing, doing loads and loads of reading, reading um, is going to be called How to Construct a Witch. And it's, it's how, how um, yeah, society has constructed this witch person. Um, often, you know, a, a woman about my age, you know, um, just, you know, maybe lives on her own, ha has a cat. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I'm doing loads of reading. So th this first, um, this first poem, I'm only going to read two new poems. Um, and um, there's in the Pendle Witch Trials, um, Margaret Johnson, um, she confessed to being a witch. Some people were accused. She confessed and said she went to the Sabbath. She was, you know, she had the party with all the other witches and she did the flying and, you know, the devil, you know, the whole, the whole shebang. And in the Pendle Witch Trial, she was declared not a witch. And I thought how massively disappointing that might be. Um, so this is Margaret Johnson, 1633 Pendle Witch Trials. Days were motionless, drab, 
and I was a sack of bones in my widow house. Seven years this went, part somber, part vexed, wholly disremembering of the sun. Then he came, all silk garbed, all sleek furred, and the promises. It was as if he'd heard my prayers indeed. He pricked my flesh, sucked my slow blood till I quickened, and felt my spirit siphon into him. Though I repent this transaction now, I had no prestige until the devil lodged his shadow at my hearth. Since this trouble hatched, he has forsaken me. I cannot send my spirit out to avenge those who need tormenting. Yet history casts me out as not a witch. If I was not a witch, how did I meet the night's wings? How did I fly? Thank you for listening to me. This is my last last poem, and it's uh, an ekphrastic poem, and it's um, based on a painting. Well, it's actually it's an it's a wood engraving, and it's um, by um, Frederick Sandys. I think he made a bigger work out of it. Um, this is eighteen sixty, and um, the the um, the engraving is um, "Spirit of the Storm," and the spirit of the storm is um, a, a medusary type witchy like woman, and she looks well angry. Um, so I'll end on this. Um, Spirit of the Storm. There comes a point in every woman's life when she transmutes into the spirit of the storm. Why not grow snakes for hair, conjure rain and lightning from your artful hands? You've earned this wrath. Don't squander it on slapdash chores and sundry empty tasks in the hollow of your living room. Get out and find a fitting auditorium. They've been opining it for years. It should not come as no surprise when venom spouts forth from your breasts. Lo, you are supreme, the most debauched of all bad mothers. Thank you. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Great reaction. <laughs> <laughs> that was absolutely fabulous thank you so much <laughs> Helen I mean you you started with us being at the circus and it was really like being at the circus a, a circus of life but definitely a circus fabulous and the worlds you weave and the fact that you make felt creatures including crows <laughs> and small white dolls is leading me to wonder <laughs> Yes, yes, please do, yes. <laughs> would you like a puppet? Would you, would you? <laughs> Not the only one. <laughs> anyway, please, everybody, would you just unmute and give Helen Ivory and the most fabulous applause. Thank you so much. Thank for you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> There's a witch around, I think, we found her. <laughs> the loveliest possible way in fact it makes me think witches are wonderful um this is the um the book helen ivory's anatomical venus and really every woman well everybody should read everybody it. in the world sorry yes. <laughs> <laughs> would you like to put on the chat helen how they could get it if I they will. would like it <laughs> but it's a fabulous book. Can thank you, you so way? so much whoa well, it's going to. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that we have. We, we've been finding that some of our um, open micers have to leave early, and there is nothing worse than getting to the end of your event, and half of the audience has, for some reason or other, gone. So we, we've, we've changed it round a little, and I'm pleased that we've had Helen after the break. Um, but I'm, we will now go on and do the rest of our open mic. Um, and because we, we have had the penultimate, the ultimate in our, um, in our um, event, we can probably let it slide on a little bit now if we can squeeze everybody in. So as well as the people that um, Peter's put on, which is Ivor Den Daniel, Helen Shepherd, Anne McDonald, Gerald Kells, Jason Conway, I don't know that he's here though, that might not happen. Chris Dickinson, Clive Oseman, and also Finn Hall and Julian Matthews. 
So, and Chaucer. pardon? And Chaucer. Did I not put Chaucer? Chaucer Cameron, yes. In fact, I'll read a poem and if Chaucer would be so kind, perhaps she could be the first of our open mic. You want to also tell us what's happening next month? Yeah, well, I was going to do that at the end. Do I have to do it now? Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to leave that to the end. Okay. Um, I think I still will. My decision. <laughs> okay. Um, so Chaucer, um, I'm going to read a quick poem myself and then Chaucer, if you'd like to read yours, that would be brilliant. Um, and I'm just wondering what, what, what I can do, actually. Um, oh, I thought I had it. I'm so sorry. I'm holding everybody up. But it allows all those waves of Helen's wonderful words to die down so that everybody else hasn't got to follow that. It's good. Um, I'm going to do um, Medusa in Love. And this is, um, it's an alternative version of what happened when Medusa was killed. Um, and I was at a workshop with Anna Saunders and she wanted me to write about mythology and I don't very often. And so being awkward as I always am, I decided to write an alternative version. So this is called Medusa in Love. My sisters sleep while I protect and guard. Many will say I sleep too. Not so. I see him walk towards our cave, watch the gleam of sunlight on his sword and shield, know my time has come to be destroyed. I love this youth and lower my eyes, feeling no desire to curse. I listen to the hissing of my hair and know how monstrous I've become. Gone the beauty with heavy tress, falling to waste, capturing the devotion of men and the lust of gods. When Poseidon strode into the temple, I was curious. Did a moment of temptation deserve such disgrace? The young man's shadow passes petrified forms of those who dared to look. He unsheathes his sword, I catch a glint of light from the surface of his shield. The snake heads writhe and spit, venom dripping from their mouths. But my heart grows as heavy as stone. And as his sword steadies for its stroke, I refuse to look upon his face. Thank you. Okay, so if we could have Chaucer now, please. Chaucer Cameron, brilliant. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, right, it's lovely to be here. Thank you. Um, it's always nice to see you. Um, I'll, I'm going to read a poem that actually is, is more page than, than oral. <laughs> and so, um, and it's more lyric than narrative. So, um, and it's probably not as accessible, uh, but anyway, I'm gonna give it a go because I haven't done it much. Um, and it's, it's on the theme of, um, it's still on the theme of, of what I write about with from my pamphlet um, on, on prostitution. And it looks at um, uh, uh, grooming and then disassociation and then what happens from those acts of violence. Um, but there's a slight content warning what fresh hell is this after Dorothy Parker? Lesson one. The sky yellow red, dust and sandalwood, blood scent in the air, sweet musk metallic. School gates closed, light green gingham from front zipped pleats. Book bag hangs heavy on the shoulder. A four-wheel drive parked across the street, hot engine silent, pleats spread, lift as front seat clicks. Lesson two. What fresh hell is this? said the girl. Unhinged, you say, fiction harnessed to a raft, perhaps fast spring rivers. 
who wrote that quote? I've grown, grown weary of oh go gentle. What fresh hell has no fury when stirred and twisted, gentle looks like any other salad, the artichoke is stripped, exposing one small heart. What fresh hell is this? A mad girl on a raft. No memory of... Who wrote that quote? Lesson three. This class is 60% lecture, 40% class participation. A partner is not required. Learn skills that will help avoid common injuries, techniques to enable feelings of fulfillment, mindfulness, connectivity, and trust. Look, a step-by-step -step guide for beginners, a swing-by-swing -swing guide for advanced. This lesson is appropriate for all skill le levels. Gain insight into the disembodied art of surrender. Appreciate the singularity of the art of suspension. The twist of cat's paw, lark's head. That's it. Thank you so much, Chaucer, that was amazing. Please unmute and give Chaucer a really big hand. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Iva. Iva Daniel, are you there? Hi, thanks everybody. Hi. Uh, this, this poem is, is going to appear in um, I Am Wave 7 in a couple of weeks. So thank you very much to Mark Anthony Owen. Perfect bed. I dream I am at Benbon Brothers, Dreamland Funfair Park with Tracy Emin. Hard by Margate Sands. I know I shouldn't drink that vodka on the Helter Skelter. Apart from that, a day as perfect as the Lou Reed song. We kiss with fish and chips lips, join hips, a turn of sunset going down. I guess it is the golden hour. Blair's babes, and even some of his men MPs are busy changing a whole heap of things for the better. Back in your room, we remember that we even changed the bed this morning. The linen, soft and cool, next to our optimistic skin. Thank you. Thank you, Ivor, that was lovely, thank you. Big hand for Ivor Daniel. And next we move on to Helen Shepherd. Helen, hello? Hello. Hello. <laughs> you what suddenly amazing. popped up on my screen. Hello, Helen, welcome. Would you like to read? Um, read? Lovely to hear all the poetry. Um, I'm a bit excited because my debut collection went off to the printers today, so it's gone. God. Um, and this is a poem from it. It's about my heritage. Magpies, 1880. An apron service girl needs dough at dawn, scours dirty pans with sand. My great grandmother. My great grandfather cracks his shackles. A free man, merchant seaman, migrates Atlantic in filth and salt to London docks coal black. Enchanted in shadows of an East End tavern, a mixed opalescent pair, eyes bright by gaslight. Her belly swells, births, leaves charcoal foundling on a doorstep. My grandfather soothed off his mother's last suckle, wakes to thread shiny charms her Aprons, aunt's apron ties. Some say this child is Brazilian or from less riotous parts of America, never Africa, always too incendiary. Family secrets scatter as magpies fly away to roost. Thank you. 
Brilliant, thank you. And congratulations, you must be really excited. Look forward to hearing it, reading it. <coughs> Please uh, um, unmute and give Helen Shepherd a really big round of applause. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And next up, Anne McDonald. Anne? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I've got I know. you. Yeah. I think I'm going to get a t-shirt saying, can you hear me okay? <laughs> now, <laughs> I'm delighted to, to join you tonight from Ireland for two reasons. One, um, I'm going to read from a collection, Crow's Books. And the other is the very first uh, book of poetry I bought at the beginning of lockdown was Margaret Royal's The Road to Cleethoff Pier. And it, I know it's been a horrendous year for everybody. And I know we've all been through really dreadful stuff. But one of the good things I think to come out of the lockdown is that we've all connected. Um, and so it's, it's a real privilege to be able to connect with you. And my daughter's just moved to Cheltenham, so I have to get used to tipping over and back. So there you go. Um, I'm just going to read one poem. And I know uh, Kitty has already touched on this. It's about uh, people who go missing. And 170,000 people go missing in the UK every single year. One is reported missing every 90 seconds. And in Ireland, 5,000 people were a tiny country, but it's a huge number. So um, I wrote this poem for May Ann Brady, whose son went missing one day and just never returned. And I was really blessed that it was uh, placed third in the Strokestown International Poetry Competition. I've been entering that for about 15 years. So... Um, I'm just, I'm just going to read you this, and it's called Whose Coat? The coat in the hall is threadbare now, and after 27 years, I still stop and stare at it, willing it to tell me what it knows, to tell me where you are or where you went when you went missing. Still hung on the same hook, the same sci-fi book poking out of the left pocket, a half-empty pack of amber leaves nestled in the right. At night, I touch the frayed edges of the sleeve and I hear your words above the clang of metal on the gate. Don't wait up, ma'am. I'll be late. Then you were gone. The echoes of that metal jangle still rankle as the last post and chorus for a lost son. And I will never know if the river was your bed or if your limbs are still entwined around some broken scrap of metal or pipe of lead dug deep into the mud somewhere. All I know is that I should have known. The last note of the metal gate was too late. You see, I know you never would have left the coat. There are days I want to brave to kneel at, to dig my fingers into wet clay and to know that your bones and flesh are sleeping now at rest. But I always knew the best of days were still too difficult for you. And other days, I wait and watch the road where you walk the hundred yards to get the school bus. And as a child, you thought cobwebs were made of silver, and I never told you otherwise. Now, there is only us. I look to see a blue ridge of gelled hair and the rattle of a bicycle chain slung <coughs> low around your waist. Black eyeliner was in poor taste for a boy, according to your father, and he left too, but not like you did. He sits by day at the windowsill, waiting, wiping fogged up glass with bated breath and woolen elbows, his thoughts mixed up with memories and bits of things. And sometimes I think he knows. And then he stands and asks, is Aiden in yet? And on his way to bed, he touches the coat and he tells me that he never, ever read a science fiction book. And with a tender goodnight kiss, he asks me every single night, whose coat is this? Thank you. Oh, that was so poignant. Thank you so much, and I'm really pleased to come and join us. I hope you'll come again. Thank um, you so much. I can't believe those figures. I can't believe I know. I, it's incredible. And like 5,000 for our tiny country, but 175,000 for the UK is, is it's just mind-blowing. It is. Um, isn't it really? You know, and it means that mm -hmm so many families are affected and there's no closure so and you put you've portrayed that uh, so brilliantly no. brilliant thank, thank you so much you. thank you and next up we have chris dickinson please hi chris hi hi 
Um, I'm going to read a poem called Sharps. Grandad stippled soap with a brush to work lava in a mug, looped the leather belt he threatened to paddle his son's hide, latched to skirt the window catch in the scullery, yanked a tightrope to strop the cutthroat blade. Dad honed the carving knife with steel each Sunday in the ways of his father, crossing arms in a swish of rapier swipes. Shocked us with blunt words when a razor snagged his chin after his wife's furtive shave. Mother kept her secateurs well oiled, popped in a penny pocket, handy to nip to the washing line. She would interrupt house chores to snip recalcitrant runners, a rush of tendrils, the rampant climbers. Her eyes guide my elbow trimming flowers. Not roses or rare bouquets, but bargains scooped from buckets on a cut through the market. Bunches licked into shape, quick as a flick of her tongue, blessed with smart sighs that toothy smile. She hid a Stanley knife in the kitchen, knelt at our feet to let down hems, mouth pinched with pins, taught us to point sharps inwards, spare others at all costs. Lost needles were a sin. Those tools worn smooth in her hands, mould to mine, dressmaking scissors, the pointy embossed gold cranes to sever threads, innocent Bruno tobacco tin, swaddled in felt, earned through toil in a shop, licked with silks, wool balls, kaleidoscopes of cottons, tough as teeth. We wrapped our penknives in side handkerchiefs, used that spike to pry stones from horses' hooves to gouge initials in wood. We learned to ignore hurt, suck the cuts, not complain. Damage meant we'd only ourselves to blame. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chris. You always do the sort of nostalgia of the past so well it's brilliant thank you so much and straight on please to Gerald Kells hello Gerald hi hi you're still there we haven't we haven't sent you to sleep yet no, certainly not and wow <laughs> that was wonderful um I, I'm in the new poem um, uh, while I was looking at the, the pictures of the one of the aeroplanes coming out of Kabul and the kind of firework display behind it, and it led me to write this. I guess we all feel some impotence, but this is about that. It's, it's called Carry On Kabul. The, A, the AE400 transporter rises above Kabul airport sends its fireworks into the hill-flanked sky. Not that it's night time or bonfire night, but all around the crowds gather for the spectacle and children in the sewer pipes and mothers on the back of pickups loot a little more of the hope they sold so brightly just a month ago. There are so many checkpoints to cross, so many serious gangsters toting Kalashnikovs, their beards dragging religion into brutality. So many radio connected sun-glassed Americans holding court, weighed down with weaponry that could never conquer hearts and minds. So many wrong turnings, they pockmark this obstacle course of guns and gimmickry. All those aunts and uncles in England and France and Canada, 
all those news feeds stuffed with calm and collected explanations, all those great men pushing responsibility aside, despots with no dust on their shoes. After the fireworks display, best to return to your safe house, perhaps to sleep for a while and in between to read The Kite Runner or watch Carry On Up the Kyber. Imagine how Kenneth Williams or Sean Connery and Michael Caine could have done a better job of writing the world. Me? I'm eyeballing the great betrayal from the far side of a television screen. These extremes more extreme than extreme. Maternity hospitals, children, schools, girls. Targets that are only targets in the mind because elsewise, how could somebody do a thing like this? And I'm wondering, when this circus is over and the firework part is done, who will lead the forgetting? Will it be God or man? Powerful, Gerald, very powerful. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And I know that every single one of us the feeling of betrayal and let down and especially for women is well that was brilliantly put thank you big hand please for Gerald Garrett um and now we're going to Finn Hall if Finn's there hi I think you're muted Finn yeah, professional. Um, <laughs> I, I do this in my own mind too, don't worry. Um, I um, Thank you for letting me read tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm going to read from my new book, which is called Once Upon a Time. Doesn't show great on there, does it? Once Upon a Time, there was no, there isn't. And I actually wrote this piece uh, back in February for uh, a Valentine's Zoom that I was doing on the Bill Ahmed's Valentine thing. And yeah, so it's called Reasons to Love, and some of you have heard it before. At times, love dies. For reasons unknown, love dies. But if we love someone enough, can we stop them dying? We hold them so much in our hearts, the hearts that beat in synchronized time. Accept that words are always needed, that the shared air we breathe is enough, enough to be in the same room, the same space, the same time as each other, traveling the same journey. I am happy to be shipwrecked on your shores, to be the flotsam and jetsam of your life, keeping my head above the waterline in your vision, to know that we are always in reach of each other, always always traveling on an inspirational adventure together, always floating on the same waves. But what if we drifted apart, still in love, but just out of reach of each other, lifesavers hiding in the mists, fingers grasping, arms outstretching, reaching. Then beached up, face down in the sands of time, gasping for air, wanting to share the air with you, cast away, far away, away you are, so far. And all I have is the memory and comfort of still loving you, even though your physical presence is no longer around. But at least I still have you still in my beating heart, a heart that once beat in time in rhyme with yours. Now all that is around me and all here that surround me are sequins, glitter and regret. Regret that we had unfinished plans of land still to see and places to be. 
at times, love dies. For reasons unknown, love dies. And I held you in my arms as you died. And now I hold you forever in my heart. And my heart will beat for the two of us. Thank you all. Thank you, Finn. That was brilliant. Makes all feel a lot better, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we have two people left. Um, Julian Matthews, are you there, Julian? I think they do. I'm going to keep. I'm going to keep the most um, important person to the last, um, because uh, she is rather important. Um, so, if we could have Julian Matthews next, that would be brilliant. Hi. Can Hi. you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, this is about uh, similar to Gerald. Imagine crisis that uh, has broken out in Afghanistan and uh, you had the harrowing scenes of people clambering on the military aircraft and some of them falling. This is called uh, falling men. The news clip came with a warning, a crossed out eye icon, sensitive content. This video may show violent or graphic content. They needed to freeze frame the video and circle the blue distant figures in red as if to say, here be human beings. Once again, it's proven that men can't fly in Kabul or Saigon or New York. The lesson of Icarus is Greek to us all even to the literate. History repeated, men defeated. Pilots like leaders can destroy or save the day. It's all perspective. It's either a cape or another caper. No escape for the SKP. No refuge for the refugee. But there are no heroes here. Just the quiet desperation of silhouettes in midair human beings with hearts and hopes and dreams, now crumpled bodies on the tarmac. I'm reminded of the photo of the falling man of 9-11, the sharp focused outline of another human being in midair, against the stark backdrop of black and white vertical lines of the soon to collapse twin towers. Uncertainty of who he was still hangs in the air. They say he may have been a staff at Windows of the World, a restaurant in the North Tower. The body was never found. Amid the ash and ashen, all is gray. Sometimes the lens of red, white, and blue is blurry, unfocused. We know how we got here. We just don't know how we're gonna leave. It's all perspective. There are no heroes here. We look out through our own windows of the world now. We zoom in and zoom out, muting and unmuting each other, depending on who's the host, the pilot, the leader. Sometimes the meetings are recorded, sometimes not. Sometimes people are focused, clear. Sometimes they are blur or cracking up. Sometimes. They are quiet, grieving. Sometimes people fall off the screen and are never heard of again. In the virtual world, it's easy to click leave and just go. In the real world, leaving always, always comes with a price. Thank you. Thank you, Julian Matthews. Thank you. That was brilliant and very heartfelt. Please, could you unmute yourselves and give Julian a really big round of applause? Thank you so much. 
lesson of Icarus is Greek to oh. us all is an amazing, amazing line. Thank you. Thank you. Where are you, Julian? Julian, are where you are still you? with us? Could you yeah, just tell us where, where, where are you in the world? I'm in Malaysia. You're in Malaysia. What Thank time you. is it there? It's um, uh, close to uh, it's close to four a.m. Gosh, thank well, you. thank you so much for coming and being with us and reading that amazing poem at that time in the morning. Uh, that really is amazing. Another big hand for Julian Matthews, please. Thank you. I'm I'm now going to stop there for a minute and, and say about the next Crafty Crows before we have our final um, reader. Um, next month, uh, Crafty Crows will be on the 6th of October and we're going to feature Sophie Sparham and Ben Poppy. Um, both of those people are very um, interesting and vibrant people. Sophie has just I think got herself, um, she's going to be tutoring on the Arvon Foundation, which is amazing. And Ben Poppy has just had a book um, review re, uh, published called We Are Frankenstein. So I do hope everybody will turn up for that. That would be brilliant. Um, and also just to say that, yes, the poetry pop, um, competition is finished um, and we will be getting back to everybody when we've been through everything. Um, Adam Horowitz is going to be our judge and he's going to have a very, very hard job. Um, and the trawler, which is where we trawl all the poems that are put onto the GPS group page, uh, we take out the best and we have an anthology each year. That is going to be delayed slightly and will be coming out at the end of October. So thank you, everybody. I'd like to give everybody a big hand of applause. That is all the open micers on both halves. They're brilliant. Kitty Donnelly and Helen Ivory, please, could you unmute and give a really big round of applause for everybody. Fabulous, fabulous night. Thank you all for coming. And now before we go, I think we might be hearing from a very important person. Yeah, before, before the Queen turns up, um, I just want to say this. If we've got any royalists in the house, I suggest you maybe close your eyes and your ears for the next three minutes because uh, you won't like this very much. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yeah, for something completely different, as they say. And apologies for the two people in the room who have already had this inflicted on them. Uh, so here we go. Hello. Yes, Ralph. Um, at the weekend, I did a 20 minute set without any interference from that terrible Oseman fellow. He, he's such a such a pain in the backside. He tries to control what I can do and what I can't do. And this is an extract from that set. So here we go. So, yes, it's been a lonely time, of course. I've had plenty of offers. Silvio Berlusconi has been most bothersome with his invites to his cowabunga parties or whatever he calls them. I suppose I could have a fling. People would just put it down to my age and the family would just contest the will or arrange an accident when I go. And at my age, I wouldn't be pressured to stick to blood relatives. Heaven knows how we have gotten away with that for so long. I'm sure one day we'll have one born with too many fingers or something and they'll have to wear gloves or move to Swindon. But I could do it, you know. I could. I could have a fling. Because... My cradles bring all the boys to the yard and you knew they're better than yours. They're right, they're better than yours. Don't touch them. You'll be punched by Charles. My cradles bring all the boys to the yard and you knew they're better than yours. They're right, they're better than yours. Don't touch them. He'll punch you hard. I know you want them. The assets that I own. What Sylvia is crazy for. 
he's lost his mind. You've got to be young. And at 89, la 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 la. Fuck off, Sylvia, la 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 la. Young guns are waiting, la 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 la. Beard is scary, la 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 la. la. Keep masturbating, crime tools bring other boys to the yard, and you, yeah, they're better than yours, damn right, they're better than yours, don't touch them, you'll be punched like Charles, my crime tools bring other boys to the yard, and you, yeah, they're better than yours, damn right, they're better than yours, don't touch them, you'll punch you, I can see you're on it, you want me to teach you? How the crime tools feel? They can't be bought. Just no thieves get caught. Or chop their heads off. La 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 la. Fuck off, Sylvia. La 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 la. The young guns are waiting. La 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 la. Berlusconi. La 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 la. Get masturbating. Crime tools bring other boys to the yard. And you know they're better than yours. Damn right, they're better than yours. Don't touch them. You be punched by Charles, my crime jewels bring all the boys to the yard, and you know they're better than yours, damn right, they're better than yours, don't touch them, he'll punch you hard, if I would say get involved, everyone will look this way, so I must maintain my charm, same time maintain my halo, just leave the fellow on, let him think he has a chance, security will pounce, it's barely scary, gone, la 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 la. Fuck off, Sylvia, la 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 la. The young guns are waiting, la 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 la. Barely scary, la 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 la. Get masturbating, crying jewels bring all the boys to the yard, and you know they're better than yours, damn right, they're better than yours, don't touch them, you'll be punched by Charles, my crying jewels bring all the boys to the yard, and you know they're better than yours, damn right, they're better than yours, don't touch them, you'll punch you hard. You never know what Clive's going to do next. <laughs> oh God, that was hard work. I am 95, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Clive. Can we have a big round for Her Majesty, <laughs> Clive Oseman? <laughs> I looked at your faces. It was a picture because I knew what was going to happen, but nobody else did. <laughs> Anyway, it's been a fabulous evening. Thank you, everybody, for coming. I do hope you've enjoyed it. We've had some wonderful, wonderful poetry. And I do hope you'll all come again. And that's the end of that. Goodbye from me. Thank you. I want to finish recording, Peter. <laughs>